Welcome everyone to another episode of IGN Unfiltered. It is our monthly interview series where I get to sit down with the best, brightest, most fascinating minds in the games industry. Today, I am very, very pleased to be joined by David Brevik, co-creator, or just really just creator of Diablo. Yes. This is all you. No one else was involved. <laughs> now, uh, one of the creators of Diablo, you've got Hellgate London on your resume, you've got Marvel Heroes on your resume, and you've got a new project at your new one-man studio, Greybeard yes. Games, uh, called It Lurks Below. We'll get to all of that. Thanks so much for coming over. Well, thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, it's uh, it's a thrill for me. As you're going to find out real soon, I am a major <laughs> Diablo fan, so I'm going to fanboy out on you <laughs> for about an hour or so, if that's Great. okay. Sounds fun. Uh, I did want to start though by wishing you a happy birthday. Oh wow! Uh, yeah. It's coming up, and or it's it coming is. up as we record. It'll have happened by the time yeah. this airs, but yeah, it's a uh, big one. It, it is. It's five zero. Five zero. Yeah. Five zero. Yeah, it's uh, you're just getting started. <laughs> That's like the it's like the new twenty. Well, right? I'm not stopping at least. <laughs> no, please don't. So uh, you got your start working in the games industry, if I have my crack research correct, uh, by Why working not? on Arrow the Acrobat. Uh, well, sort of. That's that is true and not true. That's the first game that actually got published. Okay. Uh, but I was working uh, at a, a clip art company. I don't remember if you guys even remember what this is, but uh, you know they would have artists draw little pictures, and they would put all of these pictures on a CD-ROM right. and oh, sell yeah. these things for newsletters and graphics for sure. presentations and stuff. And the company wasn't doing well financially, and they knew the Tremils who owned Atari at the time, and so they got this contract to do a video game, and uh, so they hired me as the programmer. I was fresh out of college, and uh, and. That, that is where I actually I met Max and Eric Schaefer, and that's how we, you know, originally who would, met. Who would co-found Condor, which became Blizzard North. Right, we, exactly. We'll get to. Exactly. So we worked on this, and in fact, somebody just recently on Twitter had mentioned that they found this game. It was called Gordo 106, the Mutant Lab Monkey, and it was on the Atari <laughs> Lynx. What a name. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and I worked on it for maybe five, six months, something like that, and then... Uh, my paychecks started bouncing, so I, <laughs> I was like, I can't, I gotta, I gotta, you know, I got rent that I have to, to make or whatever. So wow. that's when I left or whatever. So I never finished the product, but I, but I coded the first few months of the project. But that was the first thing that I worked yeah. on. And it actually eventually did get published. Uh, it did actually make it to completion. And uh, some people were playing, because it's an extremely hard game. It's ridiculous. And uh, some people were playing as kind of as a joke it, game. It shipped for the Lynx, did you say? Yeah, the yeah, it's, it, exactly. The Man, I had a Lynx. And yeah. I just, all, the that thing system I remember, was amazing. Yeah, it was, but it also, I mean, every, every handheld back then chewed through batteries, double A's, like in, in minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it was like, long. it was almost like a, you know, kind of mini skateboard size. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was really <laughs> big, but it had a beautiful screen and it had all of these incredible graphic features that you could... Uh, control a lot of the ways that the graphics were on every single pixel line and things like that that, that were way ahead of its time. Yeah. And uh, so in that, anyway, and we, this was competing with Game Boy, you know, at the time. So they, this was, it was color, it was way, way better than anything yeah. else out there. Yeah, so, uh, so then, I guess, then we, then we moved to Sunsoft and Arrow the Acrobat. Yes, yeah. So Arrow the Acrobat, for those of you who are not old like, like me, uh, <laughs> it, it was a 1993... Sega Genesis platformer, uh, again by Sunsoft, that that it has somehow, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, it has somehow <laughs> stayed. It's it's been remembered, like yeah. it, it has not <laughs> been forgotten, because it, it, it was back in a time when platformers were like the genre du jour. Oh yes, yeah. you could say everybody like, was making. That's yeah, all like, they were making. Right, that was it. So what was what was it like working on a on a character platformer uh, where you were a bat? An acrobat. What, what was the you know, experience it was, of that game? Uh, I, it, was, it was a pretty crazy time. I was working at Iguana Entertainment. Uh, that, that was the, the developer who yeah, eventually went on to NBA make Jam NBA Jam for Jam. Homecom, yeah. And I've got a great story. But we can talk about oh, that please. in a second. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we, um, we, were, we made Arrow the Acrobat. And I also had, right before this, I had done a, a football game called Super High Impact Football on the Sega Genesis, uh, which was a conversion from an arcade machine to a console. It was kind of like football version of NBA Jam, right? Okay, and, uh, yeah, pre But the, yeah. the Arrow the Acrobat was uh, this kind of creation by Sunsoft, uh, and David Siller was the person that was kind of behind all this, the person at Sunsoft, and he, he came up with this character, 
and we worked on this for a long time or whatever, and it, and it was, took a lot longer than we thought it was going to take. We had all sorts of tools and all sorts of stuff, I and mean, the game is incredibly difficult. Uh, and so I think that's one of the reasons that people remember it really is because it was like <laughs> this incredibly difficult platform with really twitchy controls. And, and we became really good at it in the office. It yeah, was one of, of the first lessons that I learned was, you know, you can become really good at your own video game and then nobody else can play it. <laughs> <laughs> because you've practiced and practiced and practiced for months and then people pick it up and they're like, I don't even know what to do here. So that's it. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's amazing that that game continues uh, to the, today to, to come up. I, I just came up the other day, somebody yeah. was talking about it. So. Uh, and <clears throat> did, I'm curious, did, did rivalries with developers of other character platformers happen back then? Or, or is that just like a something I'm imagining in my head and you're all just working. Well, I mean, I think that there was, there definitely was a, you know, platformer wars or whatever. Everybody had to have their character. Everybody was making a platformer. So how are you going to differentiate yourself from yeah. the crowd? And, you know, with the arrow, the acrobat, you could do all these acrobatic moves, which was really, you know, what kind of set it apart from other games. You could kind of fly and, and uh, spin and kind of go to the different, you know, make your way up in the sky and different platforms way up in the air and things like that that uh, that kind of separated from the from the pack of the uh, and like like you said everything was a platformer pretty much back then yeah so, so uh, you mentioned you know iguana and, and NBA Jam I I I don't have any NBA Jam questions because I thought you left before that project but I'm curious to hear this NBA well, Jam story so uh, so we had done this I had done this super high impact football game yeah. and Acclaim was the publisher. Uh, and Iguana was the developer, right. and uh, and so this project, I did this project, I converted the arcade machine to a console, and I did it in three months. And this was the first project that Acclaim had had in a long time that was on time and on budget. <laughs> and so they're like, we got to get you guys some more work or whatever. And, uh, and you guys did such a great job converting this arcade machine, we should get you, you know, we've got other deals like this yeah. in mind or whatever. So let's, uh, at the time, uh, here in California, the place to play uh, arcade machines was this, uh, this uh, golf land in Sunnyvale. And uh, so a lot of, lot of games would premiere there. Interesting. And uh, so we went down to, to the Sunnyvale golf land and, they, uh, and uh, I went with the president uh, and we went down there and, and he said, Okay, we're gonna go check out this new game. They're, they might want to give us this contract. We're gonna go play it, see if we like it or whatever. Yeah. And I said, okay, sounds great. We'll go play it and we'll see what we think. And so we went down there and we played it and I was like, oh my God, this game is gonna be a big hit or whatever. I, I think that this is, this is just weird and amazing. And, uh, yeah, everybody and, loves and NBA everybody's gonna yeah. be, in, well, it was an NBA game. Oh, no. But the, uh, <laughs> anyway, so, they, so I said, we should definitely do this project. Okay. And he said, I don't, I don't know this game. I don't know. It's, it's kind of silly. I don't, I don't think that we're going to do that. So we turned down Mortal Kombat. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. So I almost was the programmer on the Mortal Kombat versions of uh, the console versions of the, uh, of the, from, you know, converting it to the, from arcade to console. Yeah. Anyway, so a few months later, then they, you know, they came back to us and said, well, you know, we're sorry that didn't work out, you know, ha <laughs> ha. And then, uh, and then it said, why don't you go down, we got another game, and so we went down there, and I played that, and I, this is also going to be a big hit, we shouldn't turn this one down. <laughs> he said, okay, I, I believe you this time, and that was NBA Jam. So that, that, that uh, so they, we ex end up doing the contract, and when we just right after we signed that, then uh, he got married and moved the company to Texas, mm. and I didn't feel like moving to Texas, and uh, and so I kind of was there at the very beginning of the project, but uh, but I didn't see all, gotcha. see it all the way through. Okay. And then uh, after I left there, that's where I had called Max and Eric. I said, oh, I got a, I know a couple artists or whatever from this. Yeah, I'm going to call those guys up and see if they're busy and if they want to make a, a development studio. Yeah, and that's we'll get to that in a second. I, but I, I am curious. I'm going to follow this for one more minute. Uh, it, even though you didn't finish the NBA Jam console project, uh, I, I remember NBA Jam in the arcade as being like really technologically super impressive. So I don't know if I'm, you're a programmer, you would have a much more analytical view of it. Did you look, when you looked at that game, were you like, oh my God, I don't know how I would 
get this onto a onto a Sega Genesis or Super NES, or or did you look at it and go, yeah, that'll be great. Well, let's do it. Yeah, I, I don't think that there was ever any hesitation about it, the technical okay. issues or whatever. The only game that's, that that ever really happened to me where I was like, oh, I can't figure this out. I, this is amazing. The, the first game I guess that that really happened to was. Uh, it was maybe either Wolfenstein or, or Doom. They, like those, those were so they, those blew me away, yeah. right? Like, and so that that was the first time I stopped and I go, I, I have no idea how they're doing that. Right, and, it's uh, Carmack, it's John yeah, Carmack, exactly. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was an amazing, uh, you know, amazing technology leap uh, that had happened uh, when that, when those premiered. So what uh, you mentioned, you know, you you came right out of college onto the the Atari game, but so, what age did you get into video games? Uh, let's see. It's probably I, I had a Pong machine, so I don't. Well, that was 1974 yeah, or so, somewhere right. right in there. Uh, and then I had Atari 2600, and then and so I, w I, I had always been into video games, and especially once I had the Atari 2600, you know, I, I fell in love. That was it and, for you. Uh, yeah. That was it for me, and then. Probably 1978, 1979, somewhere right in there. My dad uh, bought, uh, brought home an Apple II Plus from work, and uh, and so you know I, that I, that was love at first sight, and uh, and then I pretty much spent the rest of my childhood in front of the Apple II Plus, yeah. teaching myself how to program. That's awesome. In basic, and I did it by there were a lot of uh, kind of magazines at the time that would print. Uh, entire listings of, of games or things like that. And I had no money. I was a kid or whatever. So I could afford a magazine. So I would buy the magazine. I would go home and touch type the, 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 the program in. And there were, a lot of times they were filled with just like pages of numbers that you would have to huh. press in because all, all the data was just like 293, 253, you know, but you know, 17. So you're like, I'm typing in all these numbers, and inevitably you make mistakes or whatever. <laughs> and so it was also, so I became a really good, not only programmer from this, but also a really good debugger because I, <laughs> I, in order to get the thing to work, I had to make sure that I had gone through yeah. and typed everything exactly. And oftentimes the listings would have bugs in them and things like that uh, that, that weren't even printed, uh, you weren't even in the article. So. Uh, you know, through that, I taught myself how to program, and eventually taught myself assembly language, and uh, and then after that, then it was uh, that that was you know I spent so much time in high school making my own games and uh, and uh, improving my craft and, and so so you knew what you wanted to be when you grew up from a, a yeah. relatively early age. Well, then. actually, one of the things that happened was that in the early eighties, uh, Ultima came out. And uh, there was a <laughs> there was a article in of all things the National Enquirer uh, about how uh, how you know Richard Garriott had made a hundred thousand dollars. He told that story in here. Yeah, yeah, making Ultima, and I was like, oh my god, you can make money making video games. That's what I want to do. And then it, once I knew that that's what I wanted to do. There was that's all I ever wanted to do, and awesome. uh, and so it was you know I, I couldn't believe that you could actually wait <laughs> you can actually make money doing this, and so that was my ultimate goal was to uh, to make a living making video games. And, and it sounds like your parents were pretty supportive of your habit. And well, your, your definitely desires. they were definitely supportive in that they you know funded me, got me a computer and and things like that, and gave me the space and time to actually learn how to program, uh, and then you know I was able to advance quite a bit, and in high school I was working at Pacific Bell doing a lot of modem uh, communication software and stuff like that, uh, and, and, uh, and so really through that experience I was able to kind of like, people thought, oh, it's legitimate, he can actually, you know, make software and make it, you know, this could, this could be a career for him. Right. My parents thought that my path should be you know, doing business things, not sure. necessarily. I'd gone and I get my computer science degree and then I, I come out, I want to make video games. <laughs> it's like, I'll see you in six months when you move back here. And then, and then my paychecks are bouncing. I'm like, oh my God, it's all, it's all, it's coming true or whatever. Uh, but eventually it worked out. Uh, that's awesome. Do you ever remember wanting to be anything other than a game developer when you grew up? 
No, I mean, I thought that really honestly that business software bored the hell out of me. And so I decided I didn't want to do that. Like I, that, was, that was not something that was really that interesting. I always thought that gaming was just much more interesting to yeah. me. And that's, uh, that's where my passion's always been. So you leave Iguana in uh, 93, you co-found Condor, you find you know, uh, Max and Eric, uh, which would later become Blizzard North, which we'll, we'll get to, I promise. So <laughs> what, what was your... Uh, what was your sort of motivation to, to take that risk to go out on your own? I mean, I know, I know the, the company moved to Texas, but, it, you know, it takes, it takes some stones, I think, some, some courage to, to say, hey, I'm, I'm going to, I'll do this, I'll start this on my own. Uh, yeah, I guess, or you just have to be young and naive. When it... <laughs> <laughs> that, that helps, right? And, uh, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. We were three dudes with computers, you know, it's like we, we didn't have business degrees, we didn't know anything about running a business, we were just kind of flying by the seat of our pants. It was like, okay, well, I figured, so because I had done Arrow the Acrobat and because I had done this, uh, the, um, worked on slightly on NBA Jam and yeah. had done the super high impact football, I knew people at Acclaim and at Sunsoft and that we were able to get kind of contract jobs to do, to do new products or whatever from both of them. And we, got to do a quarterback club from, from Acclaim, do, working yeah. on the Game Boy and Game Gear for versions of quarterback club, and then uh, getting to do a Justice League Task Force. Uh, That's where we're for, going next. For Sunsoft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so, that with, so I, I said, hey, I know some people, I think that I can get us some contracts. So the risk seemed kind of minimal, yeah. right? And, and so I think that that, and I didn't, we didn't know what we were doing and all these kind of things. So I think that really all with the risk mitigation of, oh, I, we, I think we can get us a contract. <laughs> and the, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, we had nothing to lose. It was, it was, it was easy. But, but if, uh, you know, with all due respect to quarterback club and, and those types of things, are you having any fun doing those sort of contract things? Or is it just like, are you just focused on, I got to make it. I got I to gotta build a career here. Uh, that's a really good question because I'm not really sure the answer. The, uh, the fact is that, I mean, working on video games was the only thing that I wanted to do. So it didn't really matter to me that it was going to be, you know, a conversion or whatever. Right. I just wanted to do it and get some experience doing it. I mean, I had ideas for my own things, but it was more important to me to actually, actually make whatever. And, uh, that, and so is, I, oh, that's a healthy I, attitude. Yeah. I, well, it's not just that. It was also, I'm, you know, I, I love sports and I love football. And so making a football game was fun, you know, and then so the, it, it wasn't, we chose projects that we were passionate about, you know, making Justice League Task Force. It was like, I love comics and I love Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman, Flash and yeah. all of this. So I'm going to, I would love to do a video game with them in it. And oh, I will, would love to do a football game because I love sports and I love football. And so it, it was it was kind of combining, even though it was kind of, uh, you know, the, the parameters were limited, we couldn't do whatever we wanted, we still had a lot of freedom in cool. what we were able to do. That's awesome. So, you just mentioned Justice League Task Force. <laughs> yes. Uh, what's interesting about that, I, I learned uh, <laughs> in researching you, was that another developer who would... <laughs> this is really, this is just all, this, you could never... You couldn't even write this if yeah. you were writing like a, a, a sitcom, let alone a drama. But another developer it's called Silicon and Synapse, mm -hmm. which uh, we'll get to that. If you don't know who they are, we'll get to them in a second. But they, it turned out, had been contracted to make the game also. Right. So two, you and, and Silicon and Synapse, Condor and Silicon and Synapse, we're both working on different versions of the same thing. Right, exactly. It, it was even stranger than that. So we had we'd been contracted to do the... So when they pitched us, hey, here's a few different products that if you're interested, we'll, you, know, you can have these jobs. Here's Justice League Task Force. Here's the Aerosmith game. Here's the... You know, there are like three or four different choices or right. whatever. And we said, well, we'd like to do Justice League Task Force. And they're like, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we're sure. <laughs> All right, or whatever. So we're going to give you the Genesis version. Okay, great. I had a lot of experience on the Genesis. I love the yeah. 68,000. So the processor uh, mm -hmm. was really easy yeah, to program. Because every, everything was, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Everything was written in assembly language at the time. Um, and so, uh, you know, it was easy to write in. There were a lot of 
registered. I'm getting too con that's technical, okay. that's but there were that's exactly what the show's for. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, there were lots of lots of ways that you can hold information. It was easy to access information, and the architecture was great. And so, uh, you know, I thought that, you know, that working on the Genesis that sounds right up my alley. So, we thought that we were the only version in this game. And we show up at, at CES. Now, before, before E3, E3 yeah. you know, we would all go to Consumer Electronics Show, and we were... In January. Yeah, in exactly, exactly. Uh, or in Chicago in the summertime. Right. Uh, and, uh, and that was when there were two of them. I think there's only one now. But the, uh, and we were in a section, the video games were like, right next to the car stereos. It was like thump, 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 thump all day. Well, it was much like E3. The, uh, and uh, the, they, uh, so we would be next to the refrigerators and the car stereos and here's video games. And, uh, and so we show up at Consumer Electronics Show and wait, there's another version of this game? Somebody, there's another developer making the same game? Like we had never met, we had never discussed anything, we had never shared ideas, we had never knew that there was another version or another developer working on the Super Nintendo yeah. version of the product at the time. And so it was, uh, we showed up and the games were oddly similar. You'd there arrived a, at the, is there, it's a fighting game. They're a fighting You'd game, You'd arrived yeah. at similar conclusions. Well, almost exactly, so, and like had nearly identical settings and like all, I mean it was really weird. Uh, and so we showed up, and so we kind of talked with them and got to know them and stuff. And they and is it a friendly thing or is it like a hey f these guys? No, not thing. at all. I mean, <laughs> they were kind of busy at the time because they had, were just coming out with uh, the Death of Superman game or something like that. I, I can't remember exactly which one it was, but it, it, it was something along those lines. They had a Superman game that they were just finishing or it was just being published, and Justice League was still a year out or right. so. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, uh, I think that that time frame, you know, it was very friendly. It was shocking to both of us, but there was no animosity. It wasn't like, oh my God, I can't believe that we didn't get right. both versions of this product. I'm upset that we didn't grow our company or something like yeah. that. Neither, neither team really are felt you, that are, way. Is it, just, is it like a fast friends kind of thing because yeah. of this? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was because the games were so similar, it was like, <laughs> oh, it's kind of, and then we just kept talking and talking and then, they, they sh said, "Well, you know, we, uh, you know, we're working on a PC game." And he said, "Oh, really? I, I'd love to see it." And uh, you know, that's that's what we really want to do. Yeah. I mean, we're really passionate about PC games, and I and I really I've got some ideas for PC games, and you know, that's that, that's kind of a passion of ours. So, eventually, that's where I want my career to go. Uh, and and they said, well, you know, why don't, you, why don't you, we have a little booth? Uh, not it was like a you know ten by ten like little a table. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was like a ten by ten little room that was jam packed. It had you know it was like high uh, you know walls that you'd find like in an office or whatever. You know, it was it was just barely a room. You could right. call it a room, but it was like <laughs> it wasn't really a room. Uh, and so uh, we kind of went in there, and they showed off Warcraft One. And uh, I was like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, David, whose version was better of <laughs> Justice League Task Force? Uh, enough time has know. passed. Uh, uh, yeah, Ooh. enough time has passed. Honestly, I, you know, there were things I think I liked about both versions. Yeah. Uh, overall, I think that they probably, theirs played a little bit better than the Genesis, the Super Nintendo one did. Uh, but there were some of the moves and stuff that I liked better out of the Genesis one. Nice. All right, so that's a, that's a humble but fair, <laughs> <laughs> fair answer. Um, and it, it's how odd is it that this not you know this this little this licensed fighting game it basically ends up leading to Diablo. Yeah. yeah. The, the, it is the, weird. In the annals of history. It is, it is the strangest <laughs> if, coincidence for this to all kind of come together in some weird. <laughs> kind of universe where they, this chance meeting ends up, hey, we're, we've sold our, sold our company, <laughs> we're changing our name to Blizzard, and we're making Warcraft 1 in the other room. Or, you know, it's, whoa, wow, that's really weird. That's really cool. And, and for that to just kind of lead to where it led is amazing. So uh, tell me the story of, of partnering with them and becoming Blizzard North then. If they're, they're setting up shop, they're worrying about trying to get Warcraft done, 
but you've clearly hit it off, and then you, you've just been talking about, hey, you've, you've got ideas for games, mm -hmm. so connect those dots for me. Yeah, they, uh, so they were finishing up Warcraft 1, and it was, you know, it was January that we had seen it, and we had been talking, kind of emailing back and forth, and <coughs> chatting and stuff, and by the summer, summertime, rolled around, there was some article or whatever, because this was like before pre, largely pre-internet. I mean, the internet existed, but it was, you know, still right. in its infancy. It's gaming magazine Exactly, it's game gaming magazine era. And so there was something, oh, the beta's coming soon or something. And so I called up Alan and I said, hey, I, it would be, you know, if you guys need some help testing, <laughs> I know a bunch of people here would be really enthusiastic about giving you some feedback or whatever. So, uh, said, yeah, and then we would talk, and, and he, I said, well, we've got all these ideas. I really want to make a PC game. And he said, well, you know, after Warcraft 1, we're really busy for the rest of the year, but after Warcraft 1, we'll fly up and you can pitch us an idea. We're supposed to, you know, we just got bought by Davidson Associates, and they're, we're trying to build a, you know, a, a Davidson Associates was an educational company, educational entertainment company yeah. that made... Uh, Math Blaster and Reading Blaster and a whole bunch of they were they're huge and uh, and so they had kind of dominated the edutainment market and were looking to branch out and do entertainment as well and uh, and so their their initiative was to try and make this a, a bigger division so they needed more people making games and so they came out after they finished Warcraft One and that's when we pitched them Diablo. Well, so what's Condor doing in the meantime then? If you're waiting and, for well, we, we were still working on uh, other products. Okay. I mean, we were still working on uh, Justice League was not finished yet. Okay. And, uh, and, and in fact, it finished like in the spring or summer after we had uh, finished, uh, after we had pitched uh, Diablo. Oh, wow. We had actually started and signed Diablo when we were still working on, uh, still working on the end of, of, of Justice League. And then... Uh, we had gotten another version of Quarterback Club, and so, you know, because they were doing one a year or whatever, yeah. so we were just kind of cranking out the next one. And, uh, and so we were still doing other projects besides that. Uh, and then, and then, the, then eventually we did the, you know, we got a contract with 3DO. So uh, you've already started on Diablo. Yes. And it was originally turn-based, was it not? <laughs> That's, that is true. Which is unfathomable was, to think of now. It was single player, Yep. turn-based, DOS. Uh, everybody, DOS is forgivable. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this was the very edge of Windows 95 yeah. and DirectX. So, uh, and um, and uh, everybody likes to say it was claymation. Uh, <laughs> Blizzard likes to tout that it was claymation. Uh, it was claymation. That is true for about you know like a month or something like yeah. that uh, until we the realities of what that would entail <laughs> kind of set in. Uh, but the uh, you know the, there was an arcade machine at the time, Primal Rage, that had that. Uh, yeah. that had these claymation amazing dinosaur cla claymation fighting. exactly. Yeah. And we're like, oh, wouldn't it be really cool to make to add that to the PC game? And so that, those were some of the original concepts. Also. Also, one of the things was the the it was going to have a lot of DLC. This was before DLC even existed. Uh, it was kind of a, a, taking from uh, Magic: The Gathering and buying packs of stuff that you could add onto yeah. your onto your game. So, who at what point does does the idea come along for what if we made this real time combat? Yeah, well, uh, you know, the, the meeting the, the the rumor is that the you know the Blizzard Entertainment Blizzard South guys. Uh, came out of the pitch meeting and they're like, amazing idea, two things wrong with it. I can't remember what one was, but the other was it needs to be real time. Uh, and they had just done the same kind of process with Warcraft, taking kind of the turn-based strategy and making it real time. And they saw that as kind of the push for the future. And so yeah. taking something that was turn-based and making it real time seemed like right up their alley. And, uh, and so they, it took... we. Sign the card. They didn't say anything, and so it took a little while, and uh, and we started making the game, and it was kind of complicated turn base. It wasn't I go, you go, I go, you go. Like different different uh, turns took different amounts of time and things like that. So it was kind of like a sliding scale turn yeah. base. Uh, and so uh, you know we were working on it for several months, and then uh, then you know the inevitable phone call of. So what do you think about 
changing it to real time from turn based, and I'm like, that's that's a terrible idea. <laughs> that's a terrible idea. Uh, and you know, I, I, part of the reason was I really didn't want to lose what I felt was like the heart and soul of roguelikes. Uh, I was a huge rogue Moria Ang Band NetHack fan, and I played countless hours of these games. And, uh, and so I wanted to kind of capture that spirit. And one of the things that I loved about the game was that decisions really mattered. Yeah. And so you're fighting something, and you're going to die. And when you die, your character is deleted. And so it's like, I've been working on this character for three days, and I'm down to my end here, <laughs> and I, my, I've got like three turns left. What am I going to do? Am I going to read some scroll that God knows what it does because it hasn't been identified? Am I going to quaff this potion of, of poison and hope that it somehow it like has some reverse effect or wh whatever it is? Yeah. Like I've got, am I going to just straight up attack the thing? Am I going to try and flee? Am I going to have enough time to actually escape to the surface in some kind of <laughs> meaningful way? And, uh, and inevitably, you know, you died. And, uh, and you know, I cry and slam, the, <laughs> slam my fists on the desks and rage quit for two days and then come back and start again. So, the, uh, you know, I love the tension that was there. And I felt with going with real time, like that's out the window, yeah. right? You know, I can't make those split de second decisions. That's not the intensity. I can't stand up from my chair and walk around the room and going, oh my God, I can't believe I've got myself in this situation. It is so intense. Uh, and so I didn't, I really said, no way are we going to do real time. There's, there's, but I brought it up to the, you know, others, they know, what's the phone call about? Oh, they want to make it real time. And, uh, and so eventually it just kind of spread throughout the office that, uh, that it wanted to be. It was a, a, a crescendoing wave of support. Yeah, for and it. it was. And, they, you know, there were just a few of us that were kind of the, you know, the holdouts. We're going to make sure that, you know, it's going to lose everything. And eventually, you know, it was very democratic. We went into the kitchen and had a vote. And, How uh, close was it? It wasn't close at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, I don't know, three against 15 or something. You know, it was like, and uh, I said, okay, tell you what, I'll, I'll go talk to Blizzard and, um, and tell them that we've decided to, to change it. Uh, and so I called up Blizzard and I said, we've got, w we'll do the change, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to take more money and more time. Sure. Uh, this is this is a big change, and uh, so we need an extra you know milestone payment mm -hmm. out of this. And uh, these are the kind of tricks that you learn as you become <laughs> savvy businessmen. The uh, and uh, and so I said, okay, we'll we'll you know I'll start on it this this weekend, and uh, this is like on a Friday, and uh, and then we'll you know we'll reconvene and we'll see how it goes this weekend, and we'll see how it, how it plays on Monday. And so a lot of the people went home, and I started working on it. And uh, it turned out that it wasn't that difficult to change it. Uh, I was able to basically... <laughs> Keep that under your hat, though. Yeah, well, it, it, the word's out already. But the, uh, uh, <laughs> and it was a long time ago. But the, uh, you know, because we had kind of broken the thing down into these, like, micro-turns, I just ran a bunch of turns, you know, very quickly. And then, the, you know, to get the... Uh, the character kind of, uh, you know, moving across the screen, it just like sent so many turns to make them move. And so, like, it didn't take very long for it to actually, actually code up. And in fact, I coded it up in the afternoon. <laughs> and so, and I can remember it like it was yesterday. I can, I can still, this is the most vivid moment of my career where I was sitting at my computer and... I was playing this, we had really the only character class we had at the time was this warrior. And, and there was a skeleton on the other side and I clicked on the mouse button and he walked over and he went like that and it like busted apart and I was like, oh my God, that is amazing. That felt so good. I, I, and you know, it was, it was just like you know, something out of a Monty Python That's movie cool. where they, <laughs> the clouds parted and the angels sang <laughs> and it was like, oh. Oh my God! It was it was an amazing moment, and uh, and so that uh, I knew right then that I was wrong, 
and that the right choice was to make this real time. So people came back on Monday, and I had the whole thing done. And they're like, <laughs> oh my God, this is amazing. And uh, we just kind of rolled after that. It was really easy to see that this was going to be something amazing and different. Do, do, do you... Do you uh how long do you wait before you tell Blizzard South about it because you just demanded more time and more money? Yeah, they caught on pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but they were, they were very honorable. I mean, it, it didn't last that long because they ended up buying us a few months later. Yeah. So it was, uh, you know, it was not like we had to hold out on that secret for too long. <laughs> so uh, if that's the moment where everything sort of clicks, I, I want to sort of get your take because this is the part where, like, for me, I remember... Diablo becoming like the, the the hype for it peaking. You guys did a public beta not long, not too long before the game came out, uh, where if I remember right, it was a CD that was sent out. Correct. You had to be like randomly drawn. I don't know how random. Maybe the, maybe you. I don't know. Had I'm sure you had your VIP list and all that, but. Uh, and, and I remember the winners, the li if you won a copy of the beta, like they just, you just, they just straight put the people's names on a website somewhere, which would never, <laughs> never happen now. Um, and, and so I remember it being like, a, like winning the lottery, except I didn't win. I didn't, a friend of mine fortunately got it, so I did get to see it oh. before, the, before the game came out. But how, do you, rem like, do you remember it as being this frenzy for the beta once once it was finally getting to that point yeah absolutely I think that there were there were several f stages of this towards the end uh, Microsoft came to us and wanted us to make it direct X sure and uh, and we're like I don't know you just had this whatever I, I don't remember what it was called but it was like GDI plus or some, some kind of like thing that like flopped on its face. So they were trying to do the same thing as DirectX, but it just didn't work. So they, I was like, what makes this going to be different? And they said, well, we're going to send out a million CDs. I said, okay, we'll do it. So, <laughs> uh, uh, and so, uh, you know, we said, okay, we'll, we'll convert it to DirectX. And it, it turned out to be the right decision. Uh, and uh, so this kind of demo disc went out. And the demo disc, we gave it to to PC gamer, and we gave it to, um, and we gave it to DirectX, and so you could get this kind of little demo disc. And this came out maybe September-ish time frame before it was going to launch yeah. it in it, around Christmas. It was supposed to be before Christmas. Turned we'll out get to that after Christmas. Yeah. But the uh, and so uh, with that demo, we were able to kind of like hone a lot of the game. But we just thought of. Uh, the, the second phase of that was the actual beta. And the beta was supposed to be a Battle.net beta. Uh, because we had had, and the, the very first game to ever be on Battle.net was yep. Diablo 1. Yeah. In fact, it was, it was invented for Diablo six months before the game came out. Wow. And so, uh, you know, in the summertime, they, they said, so how's that multiplayer coming along? <laughs> mm, it's come along real well. Uh, We'd never done anything multiplayer. I didn't know anything about networking code or whatever. And so I said, well, great, because we've got this great idea where we're going to do the, you're going to be able to play with people out of the box, you know, over the internet. And I'm like, oh, man, that sounds amazing or whatever. We're going to need some help. <laughs> <laughs> and so luckily they had a couple of people that are networking experts and could take the time to come up to uh, our offices up in San Mateo I think we were at San Mateo, maybe Redwood City at the time, and uh, and help us out. So they, the people kind of came up and and helped us make it multiplayer and did a lot of the, the heavy lifting. And then the, the down south, they were actually making the Battle.net right. you know, back end. The client. Uh, it was Mike O'Brien was doing most of the stuff, who's now Arena.net. Uh, hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then Pat Wyatt, who came up, and he's the CTO at, uh, at Amazon doing Lumberyard. So... The, uh, they um, had, you know, they came up and they helped us out or whatever to convert the game and make it actually a multiplayer game. And so we added basically multiplayer and internet support in the last six months. Wow. Uh, and meanwhile, this beta is going, I mean, the, this demo disc is coming on. We got all sorts of, like, we didn't have a hot bar in Diablo 1 until after the demo disc. So that was like some addition in the last two or three months of the project. That never happens anymore. You can't do that. Kind of, not on a triple-A game. Yeah, not even, not even, not even, yeah, there's no, nothing like that happening. So, the, uh, so yeah, we're making decising. It's like we're going to make it multiplayer six months before it's, you know, it's going to ship. So 
anyway, so all of this stuff with the, the beta and all that uh, really built up. Because the demo disc had come out, people were psyched and people were, really got hyped. And we announced the, the beta thing and it was like, within minutes, the thing was full or whatever. We, yeah. Like, I think it crashed the site. We weren't ready for it. <laughs> you know, it was like, the list was too long. It was, you know, it was kind of a mess. So we had to, like, figure out how we going to actually hand this out. And then, unfortunately, some people won the lottery and some didn't. Yeah, well... It all worked out in the end, I guess. Got to, still got to play the game. But. Arian Jesus is a tricky mistress. That's um, first <laughs> <laughs> so you, you mentioned this a minute ago, but uh, Diablo ended up shipping on New Year's Eve of right. 1996, right. December 31st. That, could, that would never happen now, right? You couldn't possibly blow your Christmas window and then, and then ship on New Year's Eve? It was weird. I mean... It's, what happened? Just, just, just optimization, polish stuff, or...? Was there well, a specific... there were a lot of things going on. One of the, one thing for me personally was that my wife was nine months pregnant, and so you know days before we're gonna supposed to be finishing up or whatever, it's, I'm, I'm having contractions. I'm like, I gotta go, guys, <laughs> uh, and uh, and so you know it, the baby wasn't born then, uh, but uh, but it was the you know, going through the process of having a pregnant wife at the very end of this was, you know, added on top for me personally. Sure. Um, luckily, you know, she was born three days after we shipped. But the, uh, the uh, it was very nice of her to wait. The, um, but uh, there, it just took a long time, right? It was, everything ended up taking up a lot longer than we thought it would. We worked really hard. We were there all the time. We were crunching endlessly, uh, but things just, like when you're making big decisions, like let's make it multiplayer six months before you're gonna ship, there's gonna be ramifications to these decisions. We're gonna make a direct X. We're gonna like do all these things that are unscheduled and unplanned and like, you know, things that we would never, nobody would ever really do these days unless you have an infinite budget and you're working with a small team or right. something. So, um, which doesn't exist. So the, you know, I think that uh, we made the correct decisions but we just tried to jam it into too tight of a window. Gotcha. Uh, I wanted to ask, who came up with the ending of Diablo? Because, <laughs> boy, it was shocking back then when that stone goes, no, what, what just happened? So uh, that was largely the cinematics team. Who were, I mean, the, there were, there were the gold six standard. or eight guys down there that, you know, I mean, I don't know how big the team was eventually, but it, it started out kind of small. And the cinematic team, and so we were kind of hands off with the with the, the the cinematics, and then they show it to us the first time, and like, and I'm like, oh my god, what just happened? So they wrote this. That they wrote the that story? ending. Correct. Wow. And uh, I was like, what? This wasn't what we talked about. <laughs> this isn't. Wait, what? What? What just happened? Or, you know, and it's, oh, it's too late now to change it or whatever. <laughs> the, uh, and, I, and I hated it. I was like, oh my God, no, we cannot have this. This, this is terrible or whatever. And then you know, I walked away. I thought about it for a few days and I was like, you know, actually it's not that bad. It's kind of good. I, I think I like this now. Oh, but it took, cool. me, it took you me, it took me a few days. You become Diablo. It took me a few days to kind of like warm up to it or whatever. Yeah. My initial reaction was, oh God, no, please, no, <laughs> you've ruined the game. Uh, but then I, as I thought about it, I was like, yeah, that's kind of cool. I think that it's, it's weird and twisted and, and whatnot. You know, I was just, I was so, like back then I wasn't, I, I was just a very different person, right? You know, I, I had grown up in, kind of a weird, you know, white privilege kind of way or whatever, and everything was kind of neat and organized and tidy and all these kind of things. And so for something like this to happen was like, oh, my God, I can't believe that this is exactly the opposite of what I, the decisions that I would make, right? Which is a good thing because it was it ended up actually giving it character. But now I see how artful that was and how how important that was really to the franchise and uh, – and how, how, you know, again, I was just was young and didn't know what I was doing. When, uh, when you said, when you were saying, oh, that, this isn't what we talked about, w was there something else sketched out that they were supposed we to did, do? For yeah, the yeah. yeah. We had talked about, you know, what we wanted out of the cinematics, and they were just, you know, summarily rejected. You know, there was, <laughs> we're going to do whatever. And, and that's fine. I mean, I, in, in all honesty, that's the right thing to do. Even though it was kind of a sneaky thing to do, it was, you know, it was. At the same time, it was the right thing to do because 
when you're when somebody's working on something and it's something creative, having them passionately involved about something they're creating and making it their own is super important. And if you're telling them what to do, it's just not going to be as good as if it's something sure. that they're inspiring to do. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so after that, you had a, an excellent expansion pack for Diablo, adding <laughs> my favorite character, the Barbarian, oh. to uh, and and okay, so that's your reaction fuels my next question. <laughs> is there a story behind that expansion? Was it uh, behind Hellfire? Yes. Was it not something you wanted to do? Was uh, it like a... well? Yeah. There's a lot of story behind that one. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I have all day. That's what this show is. <laughs> it was um, so at the time we were working. We had finished Diablo one, and we were you know Davidson came to us and said we really want an expansion for Diablo one. It's selling so well yeah, and, and you guys are making these expansions and they sell just about as right. well. Back so. then expansions were a big part of the business. <clears throat> Absolutely. So they, they came to us and they, we want you to work on an expansion. We said we don't have, we're not going to do that. Right? We don't, we're going to focus, there are some critical problems with Diablo 1 that we really want to solve and we're going to move on and make Diablo 2 and <clears throat> you know, number one thing is to try and prevent the cheating. Right? Yeah. We got to the, the cheating's ruining the game, and we've got to we got to move on and fix that and change it to client server. It's a big deal, but it's going to take us years. But the um, but we got to kind of we got to put that behind us and move on to the second version. Uh, and they said, well, what if you guys got to you know produce it and we got a Sierra team to make the game? And I said, uh, okay, well you know come on because Sierra online. And Blizzard Entertainment were both owned right. by the same company, yeah. uh, which was Sendent at the time, and uh, and so they uh, said, okay, we'll you know we'll give you know the 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 project to this team over at uh, at Sierra, and uh, and they can they can make it and we'll produce it or whatever, and so. They started to make it, and there were some things that we were happy about. You know, their initial design, they came back, and I'm like, oh, I don't want this and that and some other stuff or whatever. This isn't really in the spirit of what we're trying to do and, and, and whatnot. And uh, as the project went on, uh, you know, they kind of just ignored our feedback. And so it came down to the end, and, uh, and they said, okay, well, we're ready. And I said, well, it, you know, we're not going to publish this. We're not going to make this. This is uh, this isn't what we envisioned. This isn't you know you guys aren't listening to the changes that I think are super necessary. Yeah. Uh, and and then they published it without my permission. Wow. The and I was <laughs> really upset about it. Does that seems like maybe a bad idea? Because wouldn't they be worried about you leaving the company? <laughs> and <laughs> well, not really, because I was just so involved with Diablo two, and it was something I really wanted to do. But it was a risk that they had to take for sure. Uh, and I was, you know, I was very upset about the fact that I felt like this decision was out of my hands, and I was jumping up and down about how this isn't right for Diablo, and this isn't what I wanted, and they aren't listening to our feedback, and they aren't doing anything about it. And uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people lost jobs over it. But uh, it's uh, you know, it, 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 I, I didn't want this to take away from. I didn't want Hellfire to kind of like tarnish the Diablo legacy because we had built something up so great uh, that we was having so much success with it that I just felt like this was going a different direction than I wanted the series to go. And, uh, and you know, I didn't really have a hand in it. So when I just told you that I liked Hellfire, did your ears start gushing <laughs> blood? No, 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 not at all. I mean, there are a lot of people that do like it. And yeah. maybe I made the right decision or not the right decision or whatever. There were some things about it that just really bugged me. Overall, I thought that the expansion was fine. There were, there was, you know, having the extra character classes and some of the graphics and things like that were really kind of neat. But, uh, but some of the quests and things like that and some of the naming conventions and whatnot, there, there were problems with, what it, hmm. with the way that I think it was being and, presented. And as I remember, uh, I hope I'm remembering this correctly, you couldn't play the Barbarian online until there was like a, a ludicrously simple, for lack of a better term, hack. Like I right. think you had to like edit an INI file or some some file I think in the in the game's folder. If you just like changed a thing, you could suddenly take the the barbarian online. Yeah, yeah. Those those were the kind of things that uh, <laughs> that were really 
you know, top notch about the product. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I do want to tell you on camera, since I have the opportunity, uh, we were talking a bit at lunch before this, but my goodness, I, I think for me, Diablo 2 is one of absolutely at least the 10 best games ever made. Thank, uh, you. thank you for, I mean, it's, I, it's, that's one of my favorite parts of this selfishly is I get to tell the creator, like I had Warren Spector in here and I got to say thank you for Deus Ex and gosh, thank you for Diablo and Diablo 2. I, I love this. I love those you're games very welcome, so much. Man. It's not just me though. There are a lot of talented people that worked on this Sure, product, but, but uh, well, you're here. No, but you thank, get, you, yeah, thank you. Thank no, you. I appreciate it nonetheless. And uh, at what point, so you, you, you figured out it, it sounded like you really knew you had something special when you got real time uh, up and running mm -hmm. with Diablo One, with but Diablo Two to me uh, is almost just erases Diablo One from from existence because that's how good <laughs> Two was in my opinion. You know, it just took everything about the first game and and made it bigger, made it better, and took it in ways that you expected it to go and didn't expect it to go. Did, do you, are you confident, like, right out of the gate in, with D developing Diablo 2? Or is there some point in the project uh, where you're like, this is really good? Like, is there a moment of clarity, or, or does it not work that way? Uh, it doesn't really work that way. Um, oftentimes, you're just way too close to a product to see you know, the big view and yeah. how good it is or not is, right? Uh, it's very it's very difficult because you're making all sorts of decisions uh, all the time. And some of them you make, you think, oh, that was a good decision or not a good decision. Like, I look back at it now and I'm like, why did I have a stamina bar in Diablo 2? That doesn't make any sense, right? You know, it, a, it seemed to make sense at the time, but, you know, we've convinced ourselves that but there, there are things about the game that certainly aren't perfect. And, uh, and so you make these decisions, you're close, you, you know, was this the right decision, the wrong decision? And you, for instance, there was this decision that we made late in the project. At one point, I was playing a lot of other games uh, during Diablo's development, Diablo 2's development as well, but uh, one of the games I was playing the most of was uh, EverQuest. And, uh, and so they would, like, you would kill things and you would get, you know, fur and you know, things like that you yeah. can make craft stuff out of. Uh, and I said, well, it would be really cool to kind of put it, almost a crafting system, but make it Diablo-styled crafting system. So we put it in this part where you would kill monsters and body parts would come out. And so there were like eyeballs and hearts and wings and like all sorts of stuff or whatever. And, uh, and, and eventually after having it in for a few months, you know, Alan called me and he's like, yeah, I'm really like what you're doing, or whatever. But my inventory is disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> There's just it's just filled with gore. You know, it's like this. We can't. I, I don't know if this is really a great idea or whatever. I'm like, oh god, I think you're probably right or whatever. And so we removed the 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 body parts or whatever. And there was just a riot in the office. People just huh. hated this decision. There was like this protest. People hung up signs, <laughs> bring the body parts back, and things like that. That was uh, that. So it was. Was that the right decision? I don't know, or whatever. Would that made it a better game? Would it made it worse? I, you know. So it's like when you're that close to something, it's really hard to tell if it's going to be great or not because yeah. you're making all these weird decisions all the time. <laughs> what's uh, what's your favorite character to play? In, in either Diablo game? Um, probably Barbarian. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you, know, that's, uh, you know, I just, I, I'm much, I, I love melee, I love the yeah. visceral feel and then jumping yes. around and, you know, that, so I, I think that that's probably the, the class I've played the most. Who, uh, which, do you remember which of the, well actually, were there any characters that hit the cutting room floor for Diablo 2? Oh like, yeah. That made it a decent way along, like prototyped or something? No, we didn't really Never waste our it. time on prototype stuff. If we thought of a character class, we just added it pretty much. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I think that there were, there were some things that, uh, that we did. So I designed another expansion for Diablo 2 hmm. that had new character classes. In it, uh, and so those never made it in. But other than that, I think that those are the only ones that I can think of that uh, that didn't make it. Interesting. Uh, so at this point, Diablo is huge with with one and two. Obviously, the Warcraft, Warcraft is is and Starcraft are enormous uh, from out of Blizzard South. 
Was there, did a, did a rivalry ever develop? I mean, it, it just, you started from such a common bond, but did, did it, does it ever get like either maybe sales wise? Cause you know, Blizzard is selling more games than pretty much anybody else. So is there a rivalry at all? Friendly rivalry or, or is it still just well, I think there was friendly rivalry, yeah. but you know, it wasn't ever really, you know, it was never <laughs> bloodthirsty. There were, there were, there were definitely heated conversations between <clears throat> both sides or whatever about, you know, agreeing and disagreeing on whatever. Um, God, I can still remember a terrible, terrible dis phone call I had with Mike Moraheim where I, oh man, I, I was so rude. And anyway, the, uh, the you know, so it, you look back on mistakes that you've made in your life. That was one of my big ones. The, uh, so I think that, you know, I think that there, there definitely was a rivalry. But in the end, we were Blizzard and we yes. were passionate about what we were doing. And we would give feedback on each other's games and we'd present new ideas and stuff like that. And our ideas would make it into, into all the different titles or whatever. And so it was a very collaborative effort. Uh, and so there were just so many talented people, and they were largely egoless. And uh, being able to uh, you know, give people feedback and take that feedback and make a better product, was, it was just kind of a special thing. I feel it's like it was just a really strange mix of people that worked really well together. And you were telling me a story earlier, uh, which I'm, I'm hoping you won't mind me bring up now, is that sort of attitude that you're, you're alluding to. Uh, I brought up Warcraft Adventures as a game that, because <laughs> I, you know, I was a huge point-and-click LucasArts yeah. adventure game fan, and here's Blizzard making a, a like, beautifully cel-shaded style, you know, visual style, point-and-click graphic adventure, and you, uh, you actually took large large responsibility at, uh, what, earlier for for killing it that's correct so I, was wondering, I don't know if you, want, if you can tell that story uh, so we were making uh, you know they or the, the guys down south were kind of producing this product and they had I don't remember who was doing the engine I think the engine was so Davidson had all of these different games and a lot of them were these kind of point and click adventure games the educational Putt putty type games and yeah. things like that. Uh, <laughs> that uh, they said, well, we'll just reskin it for Warcraft. And so Blizzard said, oh, we think that's a great idea. The guys down south, and they started working on it, and they started recording lines and wrote out the story and all the different things or whatever. And we kept playing it and kept giving feedback and things like that. And eventually, uh, you know, I said, guys, this isn't just really isn't kind of a modern game. It, it doesn't feel like a big ev evolution in Blizzard. It doesn't feel like this is really something significant. It feels like a Me Too product that doesn't really have anything that's revolutionary in it or anything that's different, and it's kind of a basic point-and-click adventure game. And, uh, you know, I don't think that we should do this product. And one of the speeches that I had given many times is that I didn't want to go out you know, a lot of companies, they want to go out and they want you to make as many games as you can possibly make. Right. You know, we want to make this business as big as possible. Quantity over yeah. quality. Yeah, exactly. And so make everything. And I said, I don't want to be kind of the GM of video games. <laughs> I want to be the Ferrari of video games. Yeah. And, and so is this a Ferrari? And they agreed that it's not. And so... Uh, you know, it got it got canceled. So it was it was good, but maybe it was, good. Just, it was just, fine. Not, just not good enough. It not, just wasn't the best. Yeah, and I, I felt like we needed to have the best. So uh, circling back to Diablo for for a couple more minutes, a while back Blizzard hired some folks to uh, there was like a job listing for what more or less <laughs> amounted to making Diablo two work on modern yeah. machines. We're still waiting to see any fruits of that in a public manner, but. Have you heard anything? Like, it, it oh needs to come back, right? Yeah, there are so many people that ask me this question. <laughs> I mean, I, you're I get here, this question all the time. Uh, it's I know probably, you don't work there anymore, but... No, no, yeah, and I don't know anything about what's going on. I can say, from a technical standpoint, it's going to be extremely difficult. That you will not be able to capture it exactly the way it was. And the number one reason is because of the shape of the screen. Hmm. Because the screens back then were 800 by 600, largely rectangular, right. and now they're not, they're 16 by 9, 16 by 10, we did a lot of tricks. A lot of the ways that the AI and stuff activates is from off screen. Huh. 
And so like it's just off of screen or whatever, then it starts kind of like getting activated and doing stuff. So yeah. if, that, if they were going to keep the same radius of awareness, you would get a whole bunch of things on the edge of the screen just kind of like, you know, getting ready to do something here. Uh, but if you don't, then everything's kind of coming from different angles and at different speeds and doing different things than, than you're used to in the way it's run. Not only that, but a lot of modern games, they just use a giant grid to do pathing and things like that on. And part of the reason that Diablo plays the way it does is because of the grid that's underneath. And so you would have to mimic that kind of that kind of movement and grid that's underneath the uh, that's underneath Diablo 2 in order for it to really kind of have the same feel. So I don't I I wouldn't say it's impossible. There are huge technical challenges, and then you have things like you know, I'll bring it up again the, the stamina bar. Yeah. Stamina bar is kind of a useless feature in Diablo 2. Do you remove that? Well, if you remove that, then you know, you start, what, what do you what remove? What else do you do? What, yeah. do you, what do you remove and what don't you remove? Do you, do you put buy back in? Do you put uh, respects back in or put them in? You know, the modern games are very different than old games. And then all of a sudden, do you have the same game? <laughs> I'm not really sure. Anyway, it's a, a big challenge. Uh, and I'll be eager to see what they do if they decide to do something. But it will never be exact. It wouldn't be Diablo 2 exactly with just better graphics yeah. that just wouldn't exist. so you're telling me david that we can't just go file save as <laughs> windows 10.exe yeah. that, it's this not is, how it this works is one line of code <laughs> awesome graphics equals one you know that's it and then we're done <laughs> um for i i remember Blizzard was famous for doing awesome April Fool's Day jokes <laughs> for a long time. Yes. Whose idea was the Deckard Cain rap? You remember that one? <sighs> yeah, of course I do. Uh, I don't remember <laughs> whose so idea. Good. I think that I think the biggest April Fools. So we've done a whole bunch of April Fools publicly. We also did internal April Fools. <laughs> and one of the internal April Fools jokes that I played, which is just so mean, uh, is that this was after Diablo 1 and before StarCraft, and StarCraft was behind schedule. And so I gathered everybody up on April 1st, and I said, StarCraft is in trouble, and it's not going to meet this year. And we're all going to go move down to Southern California for a few months and help them out on the project. And everybody was just like, oh my God, I can't go down to Southern <laughs> California for several months and stuff. And I let it go the whole day. Oh, and nobody and figured then, out that it was April and 1st? And I said, April Fools or whatever. And then, oh my God, people were so upset. So that started kind of a tradition of all of these <laughs> like April Fools jokes. And then it kind of became public and we did a whole bunch of, you know, uh, April, April Fools are, you know, everywhere now. A lot yeah. of companies do them or whatever. But it was, it was. It, 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 this wasn't really a time where that was really something that happened. Yeah, I mean, people still did it, but they, but it was it was not really done at companies. But it, I did have everybody kind of going for a while on the StarCraft. <laughs> Look up the Deckard Kane rap on on YouTube if you <laughs> have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, it's super good. All right, so uh, what was before you left? What was the Diablo style game in space? idea that was being kicked around. Yeah, well, we, it didn't have a name. I mean, we called it Starblow. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and it, the idea was going to be, you know, it was basically Diablo in space, uh, same kind of perspective, and there would be different planets and things like that. And uh, so, you know, it had just was in its infancy, uh, and it was going to be, you know, 3D graphics and and when I was going to kind of upgrade on the Diablo 2 stuff. Yeah. Um, Diablo 2 was kind of the end of the kind of sprite-based stuff for Blizzard. Yeah, as and I recall, it had 3D accelerator support, even though it was a 2D game. Yeah, one of the things I had thought of, I, it's one of the things I'm, I guess, infamous for is this something that people nickname my shower ideas, because I would come in and say, I had this idea in the shower this morning, <laughs> uh, which meant, oh, God, this is several weeks of work for somebody. The... Uh, Anyway, so uh, I had this idea in the shower where it was going to be, oh, I could kind of mock 3D the entire world. Because uh, 3D was everywhere. It was, it was, everybody yeah. was using it. It was like, if you weren't doing 3D, it was kind of old-fashioned. So here was an opportunity to kind of do this infinite parallax on the, on the world. I could kind of pseudo-construct the world out of kind of polygons and sprites and, and make this kind of faux 3D world. 
and I called it perspective mode. Uh, and, uh, and so that, that became kind of this 3D accelerated stuff, but it was never really designed for that. And the memory on the, on the cards was limited at the time. And so we did all of these things to kind of like upload textures all the time. And it was really tough to get it to kind of optimize and make it run really well. But eventually we got it working. So go back to star, the Starblow thing. So is it just a case of it doesn't, it's not a Ferrari? So No, uh, Starblow was in development. We were doing two projects. We were going to be working on Diablo 3 and Starblow. We had decided to kind of split the company into two different projects. And we had tried a couple little prototypes of different things that we up north we had not really been happy with any of the, the prototypes, and there were problems with all the game ideas we had. But I think that we finally had landed on something with the Starblow idea. Uh, and so it was kind of fresh in development, as well as Diablo 3 was maybe, yeah, I don't know, uh, I can't even remember, maybe two years in development, a year and a half wow. into development, something like that. Uh, but we were making our own 3D engine and tools and all sorts of stuff so, and ramping up and growing the company into two teams, and so it was going to take a little while. What did your version of Diablo 3 look like? Different than Diablo 3 ended up looking like. Uh, you know, our art style <laughs> up north was different than the art style from the guys down south, and so... Uh, in a lot of ways, it was it was you know much more like Diablo two looking than it was what Diablo three ended up looking like. What did uh, I'm sure you get asked this all the time too? Have, what what did, what did you think of the Diablo three that ultimately shipped? I, I think that Diablo three ended up being a great game. Uh, you know, especially after the expansion, I thought that they had a lot of really great stuff to it that yeah. uh, that flushed it out and made a much better game than than uh, I thought that was at launch. But, it, you know, I thought that it was a fine game at launch, and, uh, and I think that it really kind of held up the Diablo legacy. So uh, you, along with Bill Roper and some other folks, left to form Flagship Studios. Correct. Uh, and your, your first project, which was, you know, immediately you've got, you've got key personnel from Blizzard <laughs> North and gets a ton of attention right away, Hellgate yeah. London, uh, which was sort of a kind of a, a first-person 3D Diablo-type game, I think right. is reasonably fair to say. What, was there pr a lot of pressure to have a big hit when you're when you're sort of branch out from from the yeah. big you know it's like leaving uh, the Rolling Stones to form right. you know whatever else <laughs> yeah exactly uh, or or was it just sort of a feeling of relief being out on your own again? Uh, you know there there were there were problems that we had not with Blizzard but with kind of. The management and the the the, the 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 companies that own Blizzard, uh, and so in some ways it was nice to be rid of that burden. And uh, but at the same time, you know, I was leaving my baby, and yeah. that 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 was very very difficult. Um, so uh, I, I think that uh, you know it. it I pitched the idea, in fact, that's exactly, Hellgate was, the idea was we're going to kind of cross, you know, Quake meets Diablo is basically the concept or whatever, the high concept that I pitched. Uh, we got together the next day in my living room or whatever and said, oh, what, what game are we going to make? And I pitched this and everybody's like, sounds good. So we did that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that, I think that we're going out and we made a bunch of mistakes making Hellgate London. Uh, we you know, hyped too early. It was naturally going to be overhyped. Uh, and, uh, and then in the end, we didn't deliver a quality product, right? We kind of ran out of money. Uh, we had all sorts of financial problems. We didn't know how to run a business really well. Um, and uh, there were a lot of harsh lessons that we learned doing that. In the end, I'm super proud of Hellgate. Uh, I think that, especially after some of the patches and things like that, it ended up becoming quite a great game. And I think it is a, definitely it's a game that was way ahead of its time. Uh, and so, you know, now you're seeing a lot of first-person shooters with more RPG it's elements true. and things like that. And this was kind of like the start of that with all this randomization and all these different classes and all this kind of stuff. So I think that we were really onto something special and we just finished it too early and hmm. didn't give it enough time, but we didn't really have much of a choice because we were kind of running out of money and we mismanaged the end and, uh, and really didn't tighten it up enough and it was too buggy when it came out. And you had plans for a, a whole oh, franchise, yeah. right? Like Hellgate colon New Tokyo. City here. Yeah. yeah, Tokyo was the next one. We had started working on it. Uh, and so it was, uh, there were all sorts of different places we were gonna go 
and different cities we were going to kind of visit and destroy. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so it was, I thought that the whole theme and the look and stuff, it had like kind of this unique uh, aesthetic and it felt really dark and creepy. And, and so I liked a lot about it, but uh, again, it was just kind of a mismanagement of the entire experience. And uh, a lot of that can fall on my shoulders or any of the executives shoulders that were running flagship when you're when you're making it is there are you sort of motivated by like wanting to stick it to those ex managers and and have a super successful game or or is it no you have I mean, more it, altruistic <laughs> yeah i think that one of the things about being lucky enough to be successful is that you realize that it's it's kind of a crapshoot <laughs> a lot of times it's kind of luck and timing and all yeah. sorts of different factors that lead to it. So trying to replicate that again is a fool's errand, right? You know, it's, uh, and so just trying to make something decent that people enjoy and taking it one step at a time is all that I'm really asking for. I can, I can never really imagine having that big of a, you know, a Diablo II sized <laughs> impact on anything. Plus, the game industry has just changed so much. There's so, many, so much content. There's so many different unique games out there now and different experiences. But like trying to stand out or trying to do something that was revolutionary at the time, it's so much harder just because the competition is so much greater. Uh, so <clears throat> then you end up at Gazillion, mm -hmm. and you get to make Diablo with superheroes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sort of, but yes, that's that's right. Marvel Heroes. Yes. Uh, you know, that's a it's a game that I don't know, maybe quietly just turned into a, a pretty big deal and and ended up uh, you know b very good in the end. And and uh, did they sell you on that? Like, hey, David, come on in, and we you know. I mean, no, not or, really. The uh, so <clears throat> after flagship. Uh, you know, went away, went out of business. Uh, I went and I worked at uh, Turbine for very for about six right, months. Yeah, and I helped work Seattle on there, DDO. Right? No, uh, they or were, they had another office. Yeah, yeah, they're out in uh, out in uh, in uh, uh, out in Massachusetts. And so That's they right. uh, they said, uh, you know, we're doing free to play things, and we're going to get the Marvel license. We know that you're a big Marvel fan. How do you feel about this, making a Marvel MMO? I'm like, oh my God, I would love to do that. Uh, in the meantime, we're working on Lord of the Rings and Drug Dungeons and Dragons Online. We're going to try and make them free to play and stuff. So having your free to play expertise coming in and working on these things, it would be great to help out. So I kind of came in and helped work on, on doing that stuff. And then, uh, and then about six months in, they said, so about that Marvel license, we didn't get it. Uh, <laughs> So we don't really have a project for you. How do you feel about moving to Boston? Uh, oh, I don't. That doesn't sound all that appealing to me. I like San Francisco. I'm going to stay here. And then the people that did get it were Gazillion. They weren't Gazillion at the time. Uh, that, that name came out afterwards. But the uh, they called me up and said, "So we got the Marvel license. <laughs> we hear that you're a big Marvel fan and want to do a Marvel game." So. Uh, uh, I said, yeah, absolutely. So I went over and, and became the creative director on Marvel Heroes. So I signed up to be, you know, I, I was kind of sick of being the boss. I'd been president of Blizzard North. Yeah. I had been CBO of, of, um, of Flagship. And I was like, you know, I don't, I don't want to do businessy types of things anymore. I, I want to get back to being creative. I want to be the creative director of this project. And that, and... Did, and you found that to be a healthier experience, maybe then? Or? Yeah, absolutely. That lasted about ten minutes, and then uh, <laughs> you know, I we started doing the different. They they had a bunch of different projects going on, and uh, this is you know John Romero was working there, and and uh, he was working on a project, and uh, <clears throat> so we had like all of these different. There were a bunch of different games, and uh, and I noticed that they were kind of few of the projects needed some help. And so I started talking to the management. And the management, they weren't video game people. They were business people. You know, one person was from, you know, a biz dev person from LeapFrog. The other, you know, was basically lots of venture capital and had lots of connections like that Harvard guy, MBA. Uh, so, uh, you know, they, they were, uh, oh, there's some problems. There's technical problems with some of these things. And, and when I kind of mentioned this stuff and, 
And then they said, well, why don't you be in charge of these things? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm like, well, you know, this, this, kind of, this process kind of dragged on for a little while. Um, and we were like building this team. I'm convincing people to kind of like come work on my project and stuff. And, and so people are leaving their jobs and coming over. And then I see, oh my God, the company has some problems. And I'm like, okay, well, uh, I'll do this job to try and make sure that the people that I've convinced to come work with me still have a job. Yeah. Uh, and I want to see this project through. So yeah, I'll go help out. And then I kept getting promoted and eventually I became CEO of the company. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I got further and further away from development, you know, and, and became the, the boss again. So, uh, I don't know. It just, it, it seemed to, like that keeps happening to me. <laughs> well, and it, until uh, you left there eventually and after bouncing around a little bit, you, you seem to have now uh, simplified things about as far as they can possibly be simplified. Uh, yeah. Your, your studio is Greybeard Games, and it is you. That's it is, correct. It is just you. Yeah. Uh, All three employees, me, myself, and I. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and your, your game is called uh, It Lurks Below. We actually have some, a couple, oh, yeah. of, couple of screens behind yeah, uh, yeah. over your Fantastic. left shoulder. Fantastic. And over your, uh, it's right sort of in the middle of, of our yep. frame there as well. Uh, so it is, before I ask you about that game, is it a relief now to, of just after years of of heading up these huge teams and, and huge companies to just have no one to worry about but yourself? Oh, yeah. Well, I think that, you know, being CEO of this company, my job was largely a finance job, right? You know, I'm going around, I'm making PowerPoints and presentations and talking to investors and, like, doing these kind of things where I spend a few minutes you know, of my time working on design for the games or whatever, but a large portion of the job is running the business. Sure. And, uh, and so when I was a kid, I didn't grow up and say, someday I want to be CEO. <laughs> I said, someday I want to make video games. And so I'm getting, I was getting further and further away from doing the thing that I, that I want to do with my life. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and so after a while, it was just like, okay, I've done this for a little while. Marvel Heroes came out. It wasn't very successful at first. We worked really hard. We changed the game. We patched all the time. There was a lot of communication with the, with the, the public, and we were very responsive to things. I would play the game, stream it on Twitch, you know, work with the community to make the game better and better and yeah. better. And I felt like that was, we really kind of accomplished that Absolutely. mission. Absolutely. And we took the game from a Metacritic of you know, 56 or something, like into the 80s. Yeah, and Omega so, and... Yeah, exactly. And so it just became bigger and better and better and better. And after a while, I was like, okay, I feel like I've accomplished my mission here. I've saved some jobs. I'm, you know, I'm ready to be, you know, selfish and step away from doing the job that I've been doing to get back to doing what I really want to do, which is make games. And uh, I went extreme. <laughs> yeah, one, one, one person, one person outfit. It lurks below. So uh, the the paper version. I haven't seen as we sit here today. You announced it publicly yesterday yeah. as we sit here. I haven't seen the game yet. You're streaming it tonight, which will have long since happened by the time anybody sees this interview. So uh, give me the the, the, the the elevator pitch sounds awesome. Tell me about It Lurks Below. Well, uh, so after, after I left Gazillion, I spent some time, oh, what am I going to do? I, you know, I, I, the world is my oyster now. <laughs> what, what am I going to make? And uh, so I started designing some stuff. And uh, as I designed it, I started making it, I started coding it, and I started, you know, it started to come together. And it was like, I had this kind of idea from the beginning. And, uh, and I got about four or five months into making that, and I was like, oh my God, it's gonna take me 10 years to make this game. You know, because I, everything I had designed had been for teams of 20, 30 plus people, you know, and yeah. lately 100 people. And uh, going from that to, a small team, I mean, I was thinking, well, I'll hire a couple people or whatever, but I was like, even with a couple people, this is going to take forever to make, right? You know, so uh, I can't do this. So I, I'm, I'm going to put this idea and I'll put a pin in this idea because it's going to be, it, I think it's a great idea, but it's just not, it's, we'll work on that later. Uh, 
And then I said, well, what am I going to do next? I got to do something simple and kind of fun or whatever. Well, I'm, maybe I'll make a phone game. So I started working on a phone game. And after about five or six months, it was nearly done. I started talking to all my friends who were in the uh, mobile business. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm not going to make any money. <laughs> uh, okay, scrap that. Let's go back to the original idea and ultra simplify it so that I could do it by myself. If I could do it by myself, you know, what would I, what would it take out of the original idea to kind of like, uh, first we're scrapping 3D. It's not got to be, it can't be 3D, but, uh, but I can go 2D and then do it, you know, I can draw the simplified sprites and all of these kind of things. And I don't really know what my motivation is for doing the project by myself. It's just something that is a challenge yeah. to myself and I really wanted to, to do it and you know luckily I'm in a position where I can afford to do this and so it was a uh, you know a, a, let's let's give this a try and give it a chance and and see what happens and so I took that original idea which was kind of like almost a Minecraft Hellgate kind of uh, idea and put it in kind of on the side and and made this 2D sprite based it's kind of it's kind of 2D the background is all 3D. So the blocks, the blocks are all kind of 3D, but for all the sprites and stuff are all, all 2D artwork. And so I'm doing the art and the music and the programming and the design and everything, uh, and I'm having a blast. I, can, I have to say, I, I have, haven't been this enthusiastic about working on something in a while. I'm up. I can barely sleep. I'm so excited about you know, like getting up and coding and working on it. And, and uh, so I, you know, I've been kind of a nervous wreck this week, uh, <laughs> showing my baby off for, uh, you know, to the world. But... Uh, so far, it's been pretty positive response. So, uh, how can how do we get our hands on it? Is there a <laughs> is there a public beta or some sort of pu way for the public to get their hands on it anytime soon? There or? there isn't a way in the immediate future, but I am going to be running a, a you know a, a public beta in the future, but not right now. This I'm doing a small closed beta right now this weekend, but you know obviously it'll have already passed. But uh, and streaming it on Twitch, and in fact, people are streaming it on Twitch right now, and they're like they're they're. There's a small group of people that I've got that signed up, and I was uh, able to get them some keys and things like that. In fact, I can get you keys, so don't we'll worry. We'll have coverage on IGN. <laughs> don't worry about that. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, we'll uh, be able to experience kind of the f very m minuscule part of the game or whatever. There's a lot more content and stuff that's in the game, but it's probably about, you know, six to eight hours of the game or so. Nice. And so uh, how... Yeah, you're talking about oh, the mobile phone thing took was taken six months, and then you were like, "eh, let's 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 not do that anymore." So, what's the what's the roadmap for this? How how long do uh, do you think so, you're going to work on it? And what's what's the end game of of it lurks below look like for you? Well, I uh, I started working on it in <clears throat> December a year ago, so uh, December 2016. Yeah. So it's just just over a year now, a uh, year and a couple months. Uh, and uh, I started, you know, from scratch, made my own engine, my own tools, everything, because I'm a grumpy old programmer <laughs> and, uh, and who doesn't like new fandangled, easy to use languages. Uh, you know, I, I learned how to program. I mainly programmed assembly language my entire career. So the fact that I'm using C is just way, way easier than, than the way it used to be. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I, and so, you know, I started working on it, and I've done all the art and the sound and things like that. So I, I'm really excited about the way it's going, but and it's gone really fast, mainly because I just I feel like I work on it all the time. Maybe I do, but my wife probably tells me that I work it on it all the time. <laughs> Dave's constantly working. The uh, anyway, so uh, it's it's gone pretty quickly, which has been great. Have Have you taken a vacation in the last 12, 14 months? I did. I did. Good, uh, I okay. took a vacation. In, in <laughs> fact, it was my very. F I've taken two vacations. I haven't taken I haven't taken a vacation in 20 years, but wow. I took two vacations. I took a vacation right after uh, I kind of left Gazillion. A couple months after after that, I went to Scotland. On a, on a big I like whiskey, and so I went on a whiskey tour, and that was really fun. Uh, and then uh, and then I took my kids to Disney World uh, last year. So that was uh, that was that awesome. was my one big vacation. They, they they loved it. It was awesome. So uh, before I let you go, I. I you have such a unique perspective, having been everywhere from a one-man outfit to a, <laughs> the, the top of a of a monolithic pyramid. I mean, it, you know, independent game development now is so much uh, easier than ever before in terms of the democratization of the tools. Even though you, you're making right. your own tools, <laughs> yeah, but you know, Unreal Engine and Unity and CryEngine and all this stuff. 
uh, is out there and, and there's all these platforms to self-publish on, whether it's app stores or Steam or, or uh, ID to Xbox, all these things. Uh, but the, the flip side to that is it's harder than ever to get your game noticed. Right. Because there's so many games at any given moment. I think there was a statistic like 40, I don't know, whatever, some large percentage of games on Steam total came out like last year. Right. Like something insane like that. So what do you, how do you kind of feel about the current state of the games industry overall as someone who's worked everything from AAA to now, you know, a, the one person outfit with, with It Lurks Below? So, uh, you know, it's a strange time uh, in the video game industry. In a lot of ways, it's amazing. In a lot of ways, it's nearly impossible. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think that with the advent of all these tools and all of the, the people's ability to kind of like get a couple people together to make a game, uh, especially if you're young and you don't have a lot of bills to pay and things like that or a lot of responsibilities, yet it, it's an easy kind of thing to do. And with your ability to do digital distribution and all of this kind of stuff and all of these advantages that you have now uh, means a lot of people are going to do it. And there are now, I think there's approximately, I don't know the exact stat, but it's something like 40 games a day on wow. Steam. There are hundreds of games a day on the iOS store. And it's because everybody can make games now, right? And there are so many people that they, when I was started in the industry and when I started making games, like almost nobody played games. I mean, it was extremely nerdy. I mean, I was I was not popular in high school. I was the kind of nerd nerd nerd, and uh, and so you know it was just like this little niche weird hobby or whatever. And so uh, it's just blown up to be so huge that uh, that it's it's just a different thing. And now everybody is playing video games. It's a giant industry, and because of that, it, it feels a little bit like almost like writing books, you know, and, and the book is, there's so many books, there's so many people that want to write books and, and authors, it's really hard to kind of get noticed unless, you know, you've, I, I've been in a fortunate position, so it may be, and I can't give a complete perspective on this, uh, but I think that there's just tons of competition now, and in, a, in ways that makes it good and it makes it bad. There's a lot more terrible stories and then you get a lot of creativity out of it too. You get a lot of unique things that new gameplay styles and stuff that be where people can take these risks because they're small budget and small teams and they can think of doing almost anything you can think of at this point. And you're getting different styles of games than you ever had before. Oh, I want to be, you know, uh, whatever it is, or I'm going to take this journey to a mountain or whatever, you know, whatever it is that, that never would have existed before. Right. And so opening the doors to these new types of games and new types of experiences is really exciting. But at the same time, there's just tons of noise and it's really hard to wade through all of that. So what's this, do, do, is, does David Brevik have a solution to this problem? No, there is no solution. There is no solution? It's... Unfortunately, there's no solution. The fact is that I don't see anything changing, right? Is it good or bad for the industry overall, do you feel? It's both. It, it's it, both. I think that, yeah, because you'll end up in a situation where somebody created something great and won't get noticed. N nobody, nobody sees it. Nobody knows about it. Then, so it becomes much more of a, almost a luck-based kind of scenario. It's like, did you capture the right thing at the right time to get any kind of attention at all? And uh, with the media, you know, it's like there's just, there's just wave after wave after wave of whatever kind of media is out there, whatever, it's from TV to... To books, to movies, to video games, you're constantly all oh, look at all this entertainment. It's impossible to consume it all, uh, and so stuff stuff is that is perfectly great is going to fall by the wayside, and that's sad. But at the same time, you're going to get cool experiences. You're going to get new types of games, and you're going to go places that you never thought you could go before. Places like uh, it lurks below. Well, we'll hopefully, be, we'll, we'll be see. keeping our eye on uh, <laughs> David Brevik, creator of Diablo, uh, Marvel Heroes. And now it lurks below. Thank you so much for joining me. This was Thank you. a real treat for me. Uh, for more from the best, brightest, most fascinating minds in the games industry, please look for new episodes of IGN Unfiltered each and every month on YouTube, on IGN, or on your favorite podcast service as well.